We'll be looking mainly at Genesis 22, which is the uh, story of um, the test of Abraham's faith and about the sacrifice of Isaac. This is one of the best-known Old Testament stories among Christians and uh, very beloved. I think, though, that we are so familiar with it that we've lost much of the almost shock that it could be about the kind of God that we say we believe in. What is the God like in whom we say we believe? What is he calling us to do? Who is this God we are called to serve? These are key questions in life for the Christian. What is the God in whom you believe like? How are you to serve such a God? Notice, we serve God according to his nature. And then what does it mean to have faith in God? And we see this. I also one who came from a non-Christian background, looking at this passage and understand how one who hasn't put their faith in Christ would look at this and be shocked. Is this the kind of God that we're called to believe in? Well, as we look at this, I see four characteristics of the God of the Bible that's revealed here in Genesis 22. It's nice to preach from Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible. Okay, so it's easy to find. Um, The four characteristics are, this biblical God is the one to whom we say, here I am. Here I am. He's the I am here for him, the servant says, God. Secondly, he is the unpredictable God. Unpredictable God. Thirdly, he is the God who provides. The God who provides. And fourthly, he is the sacrificial God. So the God to whom we say, here I am, the unpredictable God, the God who provides, and the sacrificial God. And so Christians, with each of these characteristics, we're going to ask, what's the test of our faith here? What are we called to believe in and do? Because this is said to be a test that was given to Abraham. By conforming our faith to the nature of how God has revealed himself here in Genesis 22, we can experience greater blessings in our life by understanding and living out the challenge, the test of being a child of Abraham, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And those who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, you can be asking as I would have in my non-Christian years, of what kind of a God are you asking me to believe in? And I ask you as we look at these characteristics of God, that you have patience and wait and see that you'll be understanding this kind of God and what it means to put faith in him, but also the tremendous benefits of trusting in a God like this. Let's look at that first characteristic, the one to whom we say, Here I am. Now, many of you uh, may remember, or at least some of you may remember, a 1960s comedy, I Dream of Genie. I Dream of Genie, in which an astronaut lands on an island, finds some lantern. He rubs it, and out comes this beautiful genie. Genie was her name. And basically, she was at his beck and call. Master, what do you want? Sometimes I think we have the notion that God's like the genie in the bottle. We rub the lantern with prayer, and he does what we tell him to do. Now, it is true that God says, I am here for you. I am with you. But at times, I think our emphasis is more on, okay, I'm in need, so I'm going to rub the lamp, and out will come God, and I can tell him what to do, and he'll do it. The God of Abraham is not a genie in the bottle. The God of the Bible is not a genie in the bottle. Three times in this passage, Abraham says, here I am. In verse 1, 
When God speaks to him, he says, here I am. <laughs> In verse 10, the angel of the Lord speaks, Abraham, Abraham. And Abraham says, here I am. And even in verse 7, when his son Isaac says, Father, Abraham says, here I am. Here I am. What does it mean, here I am? It doesn't mean God was looking around. Where are you? And he says, here I am. No, here I am to God and really to others means I have the disposition to serve you, to be at your disposal. It's availability to God. Notice, even before he knows what God's asking him to do. I know myself well enough. Somebody comes up to me and says, I have a favor I'd like for you to do. I don't say, here I am. Usually I say, what is it? It depends, okay? And maybe in human situations at times, that's a good thing to do, all right? But with God, when he calls, Abraham says, here I am, here I am. So he's ready to obey God. But what's interesting as we look at this passage is that's not an unusual response to God. Genesis 46.2, God calls to Jacob in a dream. And Jacob responds, here I am. And he's told not to be afraid to go down to Egypt. And he goes. Exodus 3, 4, the Israelites are oppressed by the Egyptians. God calls to Moses from the burning bush. Moses says, here I am. And he's told to deliver the people from Egypt. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. God asks after this great appearance of God before Isaiah. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am. Send me. He's willing. He's disposed to do God's will. And he's then told to preach a message to a people that won't listen. Now, here's the test for us. In this passage, uh, we are told uh, Abraham was being tested. The test for us as Christians is, am I a here am I Christian? Are we a here am I church? Or are we a send another church, send another person like Moses when he was called, God speaking to him, they went back and forth on this dialogue and finally Moses said, send somebody else. God said, no, it's not going to happen. All right. Is our God only a genie in the bottle? at our beck and call? Are we a church with a mission? How do we respond as God's people to calls for prayer, for evangelism, for teaching our children and our youth? Here I am or send another, send another. This is the test we face in our lives as Christian. And I would say it's an Abrahamic test. Are we willing to go to a mountain in Moriah that we'll see Abraham is called to do and make the sacrifice that he is called to do. For those who have not believed in the Christian God, to say, here I am to another, and especially to a God whom you don't know, can be frightening. I understand that. It means allowing someone else to control your life. I understand that fear, that hesitancy. But let me just add, as we'll see as we go along, it's worth it. It's worth it. So here am I. Abraham says that twice to God. The other thing we see is that God is an unpredictable God. This is our second characteristic, an unpredictable God. Have you ever thought, hey, I'm set. My house is in order. It's time just to keep on doing what I normally do, fulfilling my regular obligations. You know, God's probably okay with my just coasting, my just coasting along. This is the grand illusion in the Christian's life. 
God is the unpredictable God. Notice the very first part of Genesis 22, 1. After these things. Now, as some of you know, I teach at a Christian school, Care Paravel, and students often miss these very important connections. After these things. What are these things that this happens after? Well, let's just do a really quick review of Abraham's life here. God had called him to leave Ur, where he was from, and go to another country that he didn't know. And he had promised to make Abraham the father of a nation, and through Abraham be a blessing to all the nations. Abraham could have stood back after these things and said, hey, I've obeyed. I've prospered. In fact, I'm now over 100 years old, doing well. I've settled in the promised land that God had spoken to me about. I've even planted a tree, it says here. My son Isaac, the son of promise, he's growing. He's healthy. Nothing else for me to do but kind of just live out the rest of my life. I've done my part, and God has done his Really, the rest is now up to Isaac and the generations that follow. And God speaks to Abraham with a new challenge, perhaps the greatest test he ever faced. And we'll see that Abraham remains the here I am believer. Let me read to you Genesis 22, verses 1 to 6. After these things, those things that I spoke about, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Oh, my Lord. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. This is the unpredictable God coming into Abraham's life again at a time where he thought, I could coast, perhaps. But he says, here I am. And it's an unbelievable call or sacrifice. We must not forget how this must have hit Abraham. Kill your son, Isaac. Kill your only son. Now, he had a son, Ishmael, but that was not the heir. Isaac was the heir, the son of the promise, through whom all these things were supposed to take place. And then God adds, Kill the son whom you love. Stressing that personal attachment of a father to a son. And what is he to do? Offer him as a sacrifice to me. I'm going to be fairly graphic here. It means slit his throat and burn him. That's what the whole burnt offering sacrifice was. Noah offered a whole burnt offering of an animal, and it was said that the smell pleased the Lord of that offering. Abraham must have been asking, is this what my son will happen to? Will this be pleasing to God, the burning of my son? And then he must have said, but this is the God who condemned Cain for killing his brother Abel. This is the God who judged the world in the time of Noah for its violence. 
This is the God who would command Israel, you shall not kill. This is the God who, sending the Israelites into Canaan, told them, you shall not do so to the Lord your God, for every abominable thing which the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire of the, to their gods. This God says to Abraham, sacrifice your son, the son of the promise to me. All that human assurance of what God is like, easy understandings, seem to be shattered. All that human settledness, I've got all these promises, seems to be overturned. The God who promises is faithful, but he's not predictable. As C.S. Lewis says of uh, the lion Aslan, he's not a tame lion. Abraham, though, believes. He says, here I am, Lord. Notice, though, he has to go through a three-day journey to do this, with this on his mind all the time, all the time. It's a test of faith for Abraham, and he is disposed to do what the unpredictable God has told him to do. Where are you in your view of God? Are we as a congregation like Abraham? Where are we in our view of God? Or have we got God all boxed up in a neat, nice package that we can control? Maybe even have some biblical passages that we want to control him with. Have we attempted to tame the great lion of Judah? Are we willing to obey him if he challenges us to do perhaps what seems to be the unbelievable, the unthinkable? Are we willing to sacrifice that which is most precious to us for God, even that which seems to be the fulfillment of promises or answers to our prayers? Are we a hear my church? This is the test we are facing, and it is an Abrahamic test. Are we willing to go to that mountain in Moriah and make the sacrifices God is calling us to make? Those of you who do not yet believe in God, you could ask at this stage, why? Why would I turn my life over to an unpredictable God? Somebody that controls me that I can't control. The answer is in the third characteristic of God of the Bible. The unpredictable God is also the God who provides. The God who provides. Let's read Genesis 22, 7 to 12. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And Abraham said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God stops Abraham from sacrificing Isaac because the purpose was to take his faith to a new level, a new level. God will provide, Abraham says in verse 8. Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 tells us something else that's important for this passage. Let me read that passage to you. This is a great chapter of heroes of the faith. This is what Hebrews 11, 17 to 19 says about this incident. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, 
Notice that view. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He, that's Abraham, considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Notice that. Abraham, through this challenge, he's, I imagine, in his head, he's trying to figure out, how can this work? And perhaps he thinks, it seems what Hebrews is saying, maybe this God can raise the dead, bring back to life. He wouldn't have known that if he hadn't gone through the test. And it's interesting, Jesus picks up on this in Matthew 22, 32. The Sadducees, one of the uh, groups that really uh, rather uh, loose approach to biblical authority in ancient Israel, said, oh, we don't believe in the resurrection. Sit when you die. And Jesus says from the scriptures, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. These three fathers live. Abraham, and I might add, Isaac learned this. We have to understand Isaac was a grown man by this time. He willingly is bound by an old hundred-year-old man. Somehow he too is a here I am believer. And what was the test? Then what's the test for us? Are we a contented church? Are we contented Christians? Are we willing to follow God into the unpredictable, trusting and, excuse me, and obeying him? If we are unwilling to follow him when he calls us, we will not see that he is the God who provides. But if we do, we will be taken to a new level of faith and trust in God's provision. Are we a here in my church? Let me, let me give, if you don't mind, a, uh, I guess you have to unless you leave, uh, a personal illustration. So I, I became a Christian the end of my sophomore year in college. And early on, uh, I think really one of the things that changed in me was interest in any kind of studies, um, but especially just a hunger for God's word, desire, and then a desire to teach it. And I remember uh, the man who led me to Christ, uh, you know, we were talking, I said, you know, I want to go be a missionary. And I do believe God had called me to that. And as we'll see, he has done that. And, and uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Morrison said, uh, ask me some questions. And he goes, Bill, I think you need to go to seminary. <laughs> and I did. It's kind of funny. I got my PhD in, in theology, and I didn't even know what systematic theology was until I went to seminary. But anyway, so I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, our free church seminary, and a full-time student, uh, working hard, had a job as well to help pay the tuition. Uh, and it was on a quarter system, and I, I'm pretty good at finances and been working hard, doing all I could to pay what I could. Had some help from my folks, but really was doing it myself. And I did the math. And going into the last quarter of that first year, I saw I was going to be $700 short, $700 short. And so I said, you know, God, you called me to this place. I'm just going to trust you to provide. Now, I don't always recommend this, but I didn't mention it to anybody. I didn't even ask God again. I laid it before him and said, God, if you want me here, and I believe you've called me, you've got to provide this money. I'll just trust you to do that. So the last week came, and the week, it was the week the $700 was due. And I still remember, oh, excuse me, on that Sunday, my father called me and he said, Hey, Billy. They called me Billy. Um, Billy, listen, your grandma decided not to put you guys in the will. She wanted to give you, all the grandchildren, a gift. So this, today, we're, tomorrow I'm going to send out a check for 
hundred dollars. The exact amount that I needed. I had trusted God and he had provided. That was a turning point in my life. Even though I was a Christian already, I saw God is one who provides. But we have to be willing to face the tests when he calls us. The Abrahamic tests. Are we willing to go to that mountain in Moriah and make the sacrifice God is calling us to do? Those of you maybe who don't believe in God, I can understand why you'd be afraid to turn your life over to God. But he will provide. He will provide richly for you. And what does he provide and why does he provide? Fourthly, he is the sacrificial God. The sacrificial God who provides a sacrifice. Let's look again at Genesis 22, verses 13 and 14. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God provided a sacrifice, a sacrifice that was a substitute. The ram is the substitute for Isaac. It takes Isaac's place on the sacrificial altar. And this is a theme throughout the scriptures. The Passover, going back to the time when the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt, Pharaoh would not let them go, and God said, I'm going to slay the firstborn of every family in this land who does not put the blood of a lamb over their doorposts. The children of Israel, all of those who did that, their sons survived. And that lamb was a substitute sacrifice for them. And so we're told later that all the firstborn sons of Israel were to be dedicated to the Lord. They'd been purchased by that sacrifice. The Passover lamb was a substitute for them. So the sacrifice is a substitute, but this is also a whole burnt offering. And a whole burnt offering is a gift of complete dedication to God. Complete dedication to God. Later someday, if you want to look at Leviticus, I actually had a teacher who said that was his favorite book in the Bible. I wouldn't say that for myself, but it's got some profound things to say about sacrifices. Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. The burnt offering is one in which the one giving it keeps none of it for himself. It's all for God. And Leviticus 1, 9 says, it is a pleasing odor to God. Something that pleases God. But the lamb that must be offered, it must be one without blemish so as to please God. The sacrifice is a substitute and an offering of whole self to God. And that brings us to the great sacrifice, the great provision of the sacrificial God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is our substitute. Like Isaac, we are told in John chapter 1 that he is the only son of God. Like Isaac, he is said to be the beloved son who, is, who God is pleased by. When Jesus is baptized and accepts his mission, which was going to be to end on the cross, God says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He is the sacrificial lamb without blemish offered for us. First Peter says, you've been bought with a price. You're not your own. And the lamb without blemish or spot is the one who did that. He is the one who said, back to that passage we read uh, during the break there in Hebrews 10, here I am. 
Notice, this is Jesus Christ. Here I am. I have come to do your will, God. Very much like Abraham, as we can hear that. And by that will, according to the author of Hebrews, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the burnt offering of complete dedication to God. As the smoke of a burnt offering ascended to God and was a pleasing odor to him, so the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ up to God the Father is a sign that God had accepted his sacrifice. Jesus Christ is the here I am Savior. So what's the test for us now? It's not, as I've heard some very bad theology say, oh, great, Jesus suffered and was sacrificed, so I don't have to suffer. No. I don't have to give myself wholly to God because Jesus did. No, that's not what it means. Actually, we are called now to give of ourselves fully to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2, 1 and 2 says this. I appeal to you, this is Paul writing, by the mercies of God, talking about Christ's sacrifice, all he's done for us. I appeal to you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. The Christian life, we don't, we're not sacrificing ourselves for the sin of others, but our response to the God who gives all for us is to give all of ourselves to him. A living sacrifice. Those who have faith in God, in Christ, have the faith of Abraham, are sons of God. God calls us to this here am I faith. This passage focuses, uh, forces us to ask these questions. Isn't anything less than the sacrifice that he offered our only son, perhaps less than idolatry? Is there anything less than giving of our whole self to God. Isn't that idolatry? What are we willing to do? Those of you who have not put your faith in the Bible in Jesus Christ, there's a predicament. I will not hide this. The God of the Bible is a holy God who judges sin just by his nature. And we are guilty before him. Scriptures say we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the scripture says the wages of sin is death. That's the predicament. But there's good news. Good news greater than our predicament of our sin. That holy God loves us. That holy God so loved the world that opposed him that he gave his only begotten son that if we believe in him, we have eternal life. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us. The holy God provides a substitute for us, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's death on the cross brings us forgiveness. We are forgiven by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Once again, I'd like to speak personally because I am aware of what it's like growing up as a non-Christian. I didn't believe in the Bible. I thought it was a bunch of fairy tales. Okay. The Lord changed my heart, but he also changed my mind that I saw it was true. And at the end of my sophomore year in college, I saw that Christianity was true. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Now, frankly, you know, I'm saying here I am in my conversion. I didn't know all God had in store for me. In the beginning of any relationship, in some ways, we don't know what all's in store for us. And certainly when you give your life to Christ, you don't know at the initial point what all God has for you. I certainly didn't know at that time that I was going to be being sent overseas, to the mission field, away from family. Although I did pick up a lovely wife. I say that. Oh, there she goes. She never likes that. But I didn't know what God had for me. I didn't. And there were challenges, and there continue to be challenges. But I can say in the 50-plus years 
that the unpredictable God is the one who called me to do things in places I could have never imagined, and he has always, always provided for me. I can say with confidence that God will continue to provide for me, and that when he calls me to leave this life, I have a home in heaven, and I am confident of that, that he provides, for he is the one who conquered the grave. Jesus Christ is risen. And I can say to you that if you do not know Jesus Christ and you're fearful, I understand that. But trust in him and he will provide for you in ways that you could never imagine. Amen? Amen. All right, let's uh, stand and I'll give a benediction. <laughs> May the God who calls us to follow him find in us and give us the grace to say, here I am, and to provide for us in all things. The Lord be with you. Amen.